Live from Santa Barbara, welcome to Compassionate Connection. I'm your hostess, Gigi Amore, and the purpose and the intent of our show is to share with you how to connect compassionately within ourselves and with others when we choose to gain this knowledge of nonviolent communication, the language of peace, we can transform and enrich our relationship within ourselves and with others. So with that being said, I'd like to go ahead and reflect on the founder of this language of life, this language of peace, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg. And oh my goodness, his most popular best-selling book now is in a minimum of 26 various languages and 45 countries throughout the globe. And I'm just thrilled with being a part of gaining his knowledge for my own well-being and sharing it with our viewers, friends, family, anybody that's open to have that richness in their communication, which is what it's all about. So with that being said, I'm excited. Tonight we're going to be doing a show actually focused on compassionate communication. And I'm thrilled to have Heba Hampton with us this evening. It's really a pleasure. I feel so honored that you dared to come on air with me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and now I'd like to just share a few things about you to our viewers, Heba. And this is a little background information for people that don't already know you in our community. But Heba Hamden is an electrical engineer who's worked for two of the largest international telecommunication companies where she has successfully managed large scale projects for global customers, Japan Airlines, Delta Airlines, Procter & Gamble, and provided technical training in Europe and North America. This is to name a few, I'm sure. And so in March of 20, 2008, excuse me, HIPAA founded her own counseling and coaching business in Redondo Beach, California. And since then, she has been helping her clients creating compelling presentations and communication plans to skyrocket their successes. What a gift. Now, Heba was also on the board of the National Speakers Association in Los Angeles from 2012 until 2015 when she moved here in our lovely, beautiful Santa Barbara with her husband. And so, wow. She has been volunteering for TV Santa Barbara as a way to find new friends and get to know her new city here. Heba learned about media from her wonderful mentors. And that was in 2017 where she started a part-time job here at the station as TV programming director. And how fortunate that from your international business that HIPAA speaks English, French, aerobic, and Spanish. I'm still working on English personally, but hey, that's great. <laughs> Thank you for being with us tonight, dear. Thank you for having me, Gigi. It's an honor. I can tell from the first day that I stepped in the studio and you were on board, it's like, oh, this girl just has that compassion and knows how to speak with people in a tone and with energy that really is going to get everybody's needs met. And that's when I wanted you on the air with us. <laughs> so thank you for stepping up. Thank you. <laughs> now, I, I know, you know, there's a lot about you that I'd like to explore as we've become friends as well. But one of the first questions I'd like to present for a little more information from you is your, of course, now local. I'm up on you there. I'm seventh <laughs> generation, yes. as I'm sure I'm proud of it, right? And <laughs> my friend Glenn Williams uh, call us uh, Santa Barbarian. <laughs> Perfectly put, exactly. Proud Santa Barbarians. <laughs> well, you're the energy we want in this town, no Thank doubt you. about it. 
And I know that prior to getting here, you were in Redondo Beach. That's, of course, our Los Angeles area. And please tell us about where you actually grew up. Well, um, I was born and grew up in Lebanon, the country, Lebanon, and um, my teenage years up until college time uh, were uh, in the middle of the civil war that took place in Lebanon for 15 years. Uh, so I grew up in this environment. It was tough. Uh, still, I was able to finish my studies, uh, complete uh, my bachelor degree in engineering. And then uh, there was an opportunity to move to more, uh, North America. So I uh, moved to Canada, Montreal, Canada. And Montreal because I spoke French in Lebanon. It's Arabic and French. Uh, as official languages. And I got a job within three months there. And um, within a few years, I had a job transfer to the US. So the company moved me to, to the US and um, have been here since. Uh, the company had relocated uh, to Atlanta, Georgia as far as headquarters. They closed their offices, so I went to another company, uh, Bridge Telecom, and then after that I started my own business in Redondo. My husband got a job in Santa Barbara, so it was a dream come true sooner than uh, we expected. We used to come here and I fell in love with Santa Barbara the first time I was here. And that was in the year 2000, just after we got married. And uh, uh, Cottage Hospital was, used to be my husband's uh, customer. And um, I was dreaming that, ah, okay, probably when we retire, 20, 30 years <laughs> from now, probably we move to Santa Barbara. But it happened in 2015. Well, look at that. You have just gone full circle with tremendous courage, and you actually ended up where you really wanted to be. Yeah, it's, um, it's just um, some people call it lucky, but I call it hard work and focus. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yes. Yes, you were determined and that to, was a big To part. lead a happier life. Oh my gosh. And that led me and my husband to, to this town, to California. And, and you really have been gifted to be able to even give back to your family as well in this process, from my understanding. Definitely, definitely. When I left Lebanon um, in the early 90s, the civil war had ended uh, in 1990. Um, so there was uh, no issue about being at risk or being under bombs and bullets. But I wanted to see what would happen with my future and see if I can help my family better, and um, this was indeed the case. I started to work and was able to help them financially uh, way more than if I had stayed in Lebanon. And it's a beautiful country, uh, but the politics there and all the situation isn't what I wish to, to be in. Do you go back? To visit by yes, any yeah, we go visit uh, the family members uh, who are still there um, every other year or so. How awesome is that? <laughs> I love this story. Thank you. That is beautiful. I think this is encouraged for any viewers as well to be able to live their dream. Yes. That's wonderful. Yeah. And, and I know now you're going to be sharing <laughs> with those tips to better communicate with compassion. Yay. <laughs> and how did you personally learn about these techniques? And I'm kind of guessing, well, how about you explain it? Yes. Um, so our topic tonight is uh, about compassionate communication. And uh, some people, uh, Gigi, uh, confuse being compassionate or being nice with being naive. And it's not the case. 
as you've experienced, you know, over the past two years I've known you, I have the job done as it needed and always on top of it. So being nice isn't a way to act without thinking or being naive dealing with people. And uh, compassion is healing, not only to the people you are compassionate with, but I believe to us as well. So even if we confront harsh people, if we deal with them with compassion, that is healing to the both of us. Beautifully said. I really appreciate that. That's almost as if, you know, what you give is what you do receive and maybe that will inspire other people to be a little nice out there, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, uh, I found out uh, that speaking with compassion and uh, succeeding in establishing that deep connection with people um, help to succeed in life and in business. And I've experienced it in, in my career, during my career and uh, in my own business. And um, uh, speaking isn't really about the language. I have an accent, <laughs> uh, yet, and it's not about English. It's about that connection. And you, of all people, are the expert. I mean, this is the show about <laughs> compassionate connection. And um, the way to connect with people, speak with them in a way that would get their attention. I didn't learn this only from uh, my career through the business I did or the training I used to deliver internationally or in the National Speakers Association where I uh, learned the skills and the techniques of delivering successful presentations and teaching people to give successful presentations. Uh, in fact, when I thought about it, um, in the past few years, I realized I learned uh, these techniques while growing up in a civil war in Lebanon. And um, I found out three ways would help us establish a better connection with people. And these are first to show respect to the people we're connecting with, we're communicating with. And second, not to assume, is just ask question before you judge and assume. And the third um, way is to speak positive. Yes, beautifully put. Those are three really great, would you call those tools? And tools, tips? techniques, yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh steps to better uh, communication thus better connection and from there you never know how this will lead you to better succeed as I said in life and in business. Perfectly put, beautifully put and I'm just wondering I know that you've done a lot of work with international teams and with the National Speakers Association so you probably learned a lot from them as well along the way. Definitely, definitely. Nice. And uh, I've done uh, one year of uh, the, the academy program at the NSA. So the following year when they asked me to be on the board, I was surprised. I mean, I said, well, I have an accent and, you know, how come? And it was because of the results that I delivered working with other students or helping other students that they, they saw some potential and uh, they put me on the board and I was helping with the academy working with professionals who want to improve their presentation and speaking skills. And, and so even your voice tone and your accent are, are, are captivating. I just want you to know <laughs> oh, that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Still, uh, Gigi, uh, remember I'm uh, from Lebanon, so this is a Mediterranean country. And, you know, Le we Lebanese like 
I'm now American, but you know, of Lebanese origins, like Greeks or Italian and all like Southern France, uh, we have this passion, we, we have this, you know, energy and uh, we can be sometimes loud. And like if you see two Italians uh, speaking with each other, you think they're going to fight and you get closer and see they're telling each other how much they miss each other and how much they love each other. <laughs> <laughs> so same thing uh, for me growing up in Lebanon, but I learned the techniques on how to control my hand gestures. I tend to, you know, okay. speak with my hands and also uh, speak um, uh, just slower and with poses. So as uh, my message and what I'm saying is understood, especially that I have an accent. Mm -hmm. That is nice to know because I know I've traveled places where they start getting all heated up and I'm like, well, what's going on? Is this going to break into a fight? Where's my accent? <laughs> so, yeah, the passion and all the, yeah, there you go. So you've really toned it down so you really could be heard and you really could connect with them on another level. Yes, definitely. A win-win, huh? It is. <laughs> Did you kind of tame anybody along the way? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we need to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a good answer. Like, what went wrong? Oh, I don't know what went wrong. You have to ask the other person. <laughs> I take the fifth. I'm not telling. I've been advised to do that on many occasions. <laughs> well, Okay, so let's explore this. I, I know the number one communication tip for compassion is, is what you've been speaking about. So with the body language maybe going against it and the voice tone and all that, what are you saying inside of you to keep that from, well, you really want to go there, it's on. Uh, how do you turn that thinking up if perhaps you get triggered by this is too loud, this is too much and aggressive. Yes. Um, tip one, as I had mentioned, it's show respect. And I didn't say like speak with respect or respect others, show respect. And that includes the language and the gestures. Um, like the saying uh, uh, goes, um, your silence speaks volumes. Sometimes without even, you know, getting any word out of our mouth, we give the impression to the others that we don't stand them <laughs> or we are not respectful to them uh, or we love them or that we are putting a wall between us and them. So the body language says it more than the words. And showing respect would be to keep in mind that everybody would have their own circumstances, would have their um, own motives or whatever they're going through so as to sometimes shout, yell, or do certain things that irritates you. But when you confront this with showing them respect, automatically, I mean, it's, ah, okay, let me go back to my better me, my better self, and behave. Somehow, subconsciously, it, um, it helps the other person. Plus, it helps us because that calm, uh, 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 that uh, fact of uh, staying positive, staying respectful is healthier. If we start to confront or go angry, uh, that would create a lot of um, uh, uh, hor you know, hormone creation in our bodies or other factors or um, ingredients uh, that the brain would spread into the bloodstream 
and would contribute to us getting sick probably mm. slowly or quickly. So it's not only about the others, it's also about us to have this compassionate connection and to have that respect. And I believe everybody in the world, you, you know, deserves to be respected. They have whatever, um, you know, they, they are in. And when you know more, you could understand probably and appreciate. But if you don't, you just you're seeing the the front, and that that wouldn't help if you act on that front, which would be negative. And I, yes. I, you see, Gigi, I uh, used this um, without realizing it, like showing respect uh, during the war in Lebanon, because. I used to go to school and college under bombs and bullets and all this and go to very risky areas. Like, uh, for example, um, at a certain stage, I used to give tutoring lessons after uh, college, which was in the evening. And uh, there was uh, this uh, young uh, girl, um, intermediate school, I gave her, you know, tutoring lessons in a really harsh, risky area where there are people with, with their arm weapons and you would, uh, you know, go there and bullets start flying sometimes. But I had to do it uh, because I was supporting myself and helping my mother at the same time. Uh, so one time I was going to that area and by the way, I used to drive a motorcycle at that time. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Fred has a picture of that. <laughs> Dangerous. There you go. Oh, look at that. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that is great. <laughs> As you see, the helmet is probably bigger than my motorcycle. <laughs> but this was what I could afford and that motorcycle saved me money to go to college rather than uh, taking cars or other uh, ways of transportation. There was no public buses provided at the time because it was a war zone. Uh, so I drove my motorcycle and most of the time, because I was one of the first, if not the first, <laughs> probably I was the first to go in the mountain areas. Uh, uh, first female uh, to drive a motorcycle in the mountain areas. But in Beirut, I could be probably the second. Uh, and uh, people wouldn't know that this was a girl because I have the helmet, short hair, and they think, ah, this is a boy. Okay, passing by. Until uh, that night when I was going to tutor that uh, girl and uh, a, an armed uh, uh, yet gentleman, a young gentleman, stopped me. And I got really scared because before I would pass and nobody stopped me. So how about now somebody with his weapons and all this uh, coming into me, stopping me and uh, asking me where I was going. So uh, I uh, took the helmet out and uh, I said hello and spoke very respectfully. And I looked into his eyes and I showed that compassion because I thought he could be put there, not because he wanted to, but because he was forced to. Because if he didn't play the security guard, uh, he would have been put into a worse situation or if he rejected that, you know, order, he would have been killed. So he could have his own circumstances and just looked him in, into the eyes and said, I'm going to teach uh, the girl in that area and her father is so-and-so, gave him the name. and." 
he said okay and he went and checked about the father at the time there uh, were no cell phones yet so oh he gosh. had his talkie walkie and he knew people other armed people in that area where I'm going to and he asked oh, do you know that person and they said yeah I said okay so he came back to me and said okay you can go but if I showed, if I reacted in a negative way, or if I had my, you know, body gesture tell that um, I don't like this person, I don't like this situation I'm in, uh, whatsoever, God knows what could have happened. So showing respect is not only to establish that regular day-to-day -day communication at work, uh, um, in town, at a club, it can be a survival tool. Oh, that's a beautiful example. I mean, most people don't have it to that extreme. It could have been your life. Yes. It really could have. Yes. Yes. So, show respect. It always help to establish a better connection. We're, we're always... Or help. Yeah, we're, we're human <laughs> beings Keep and you alive. we all want that. We want to be valued, we want to be heard, we want to be seen, but above all that respect is the key element, isn't it? All the way through, or otherwise you might not be sitting here today. Ay yeah. Ay ay. yeah. Well, I, I know that we all have that ten tendency, of course, to judge other people and so inside of you, once again, when you're talking to someone and they remind you, like some people would say, oh, I had PTSD, this person reminded me of flashback of a bad circumstances or situation. So that self-empathy talk comes up and alive within you so that you can be more present with what is without the judgment of bad guy, good guy, and all that that you actually grew up with. Yes, absolutely. And um, we all have the tendency to judge others. <laughs> I guess it's in our gene. Uh, but it can get less and in a better um, reaction if we control it, if we are conscious about what we're thinking so we need to keep reminding ourselves that okay that person may remind me of a bad situation or a bad per another person that i had bad experience with but i still don't know this person so i need to get to know them and i need to first respect then see what happens. If they really show they're not worth me connecting with them, then I will stay away. But let's try and establish this connection because with my experience, I've always had great results. I've always learned something new uh, from the people I connected with. Uh, here in the U.S. or when I traveled internationally, anywhere. It's an education, right? It's an education. We always learn something. And sometimes uh, this, uh, this process may reflect on us that we see things in ourselves that we didn't see before, but we learn about it when we deal with these other people. So just keep that self-check and in time it becomes automatic. Uh, I remember uh, Gigi like um, probably uh, 10 years ago before we moved to Santa Barbara we, we were going to Oxnar uh, just for the weekend we stayed in a hotel and um, my husband uh, left me for a little bit I stayed in the bar area we were just getting in and um, I saw a bunch of young ladies getting into that restaurant area. It's a hotel, okay, and yes. bar area in their PJs, in their pajamas. And, you know, I looked at, I rolled my eyes and, 
I mean, <laughs> come on, teenagers and pajamas in a, a, a five star or more, you know, hotel, a luxury hotel. What are they doing? And I thought, okay, it's a PJ night, these girls getting together. And then it struck me. Isn't it better that these girls are meeting here rather than going out on their selves and doing drugs and doing alcohol or whatsoever? Isn't it better? Mm. Mm. Wouldn't I yes. wish so, you know, better situation, safer for my niece or my, my child? That's beautiful. You transformed the story from the eye rolling and, you know, all of that yeah. into something that well, how sweet, you yeah, know, this yes. is really a more peaceful way of having a gathering. Right. So it's that self, you know, uh, talking in our brain. And at that moment, I said to myself, I will keep check, keep myself in check so that not to judge others. And, you know, 10 years ago I had started to do uh, public speaking presentations and I used to tell people how you know I would be judged myself coming from Lebanon being from the Middle East and all that so I was telling people how bad it is to judge before getting to know others and I found myself I caught myself up judging uh, so I promise myself and we we keep having it sometimes but with the years when you practice it it will be less and less and you immediately catch yourself in judging uh, okay uh, I need to know that person before I create an idea about them oh that's being so open peaceful and compassionate right there to be able to have that insight and be mindful of it. Right. And healthier for us too, right? Definitely. <laughs> and that, you know, that brings us to the second tip, the second tool, which is ask mm. and don't assume. Before you judge, before you assume, ask questions to know more. And um, uh, when I first got into speaking, uh, I found out once by, by chance uh, that people in the audience I had thought that in, in Lebanon women have the scarf, you know, the veil, or Lebanon is a Muslim country. So I started to do a certain exercise and I would ask, okay, let's break the ice and I, they introduce themselves, then I introduce myself and uh, who thinks that uh, Lebanon is a Muslim country and almost all room, all people in the audience raise their hand. Uh, who thinks there is a desert, sandy desert in Lebanon and three quarter of the room they, they raise their hands. And then I tell them, well, Lebanon is a Mediterranean country. There is the cedars, and the, the weather is like California. There is the Mediterranean Sea, and there is the cedars that are mentioned about in the, in the Bible. Even the word Bible comes from Byblos, uh, which is a small city, old city in Lebanon, very old city. And um, I tell them there is no desert in, in Lebanon. It's a beautiful weather, and it's not a Muslim country. In fact, the president has to be Christian by law. There is a Muslim, um, uh, that's a higher percentage. A higher population percentage of Muslims, like 65% compared to Christians. Uh, but it's not a Muslim country, it's a democratic country and free trade even. Isn't this interesting? Well, I'm learning something myself. I mean, right there, you know, yeah. you kind of like judging people, the right. images and all of that. Yeah, and all what we hear about the news, and we tend to generalize. Like they would be talking about the Middle East, so our brain goes Lebanon, Middle East, so Le Lebanon is like Saudi Arabia, for example, or other countries. So it, it's normal. This is very normal. Yes. So we don't have to blame ourselves. We're human. But it's just we need to educate ourselves. Ask, More don't education. assume. Oh, I like that. Well, I think we're going to take a couple of minutes and we're going to reflect on what Marshall has to say on being 
late to work in case anybody out there has had that issue. <laughs> I know I have. We'll be right back. Um, I've heard just some amazing dialogue about com conflict resolution. Uh, I'm still a bit confused being that I'm a manager of a large company and also uh, want to raise a family. How to bring uh, this consciousness into not using rewards or punishment uh, in my dealings with people and, and my future family. So give me some situations, both at, at work and or the family, where it would seem difficult to look at options other than punishment or reward. What kind of situations seem impossible to deal with without those two? An employee that continues to show up late for work and uh, is not doing the job that they're paid to do. Come on up here and uh, we'll, we'll see how to deal with this rascal. So you've asked me to come in and uh, I have been late for work regularly and uh, certain jobs I have not done to your satisfaction. Uh, if I wanted this person to produce more to meet my needs for protecting the organization, uh, the most powerful way I could begin would be to show that I'm interested in the needs that keep him from doing what I would like. So whatever it is, the more, in fact, the more threatening the other person's behavior, as I mentioned yesterday, the more important it is to be able to begin the dialogue with empathizing with the needs that keep the person from behaving as we would like. So if I'm, as I told you yesterday, as I'm working in prisons, if I'm working with somebody who is molesting children, I want to begin the dialogue by empathizing with the needs that lead this person to do this. If I'm working in countries where people are killing others, uh, it's not the way I'd like to resolve the conflicts there. I begin by empathizing with their reasons for meeting their needs that way. Because I want to be sure that it's never my objective to change the other person. Whether it's a child that's doing something that I think is not in harmony with their needs or my needs, an employee, or in these more dramatic cases. I want to be sure that it's not my objective to get them to do what I want. Now, that's pretty hard in a managerial situation, since that's almost the, um, the stereotype of the good manager, is able to get results, you see. So, nonviolent communication, that's not our objective, to get results. I was hired by a Connecticut General Life Insurance one time, I was shocked when the man heard me at his church wanted me to work with his salespeople. I said, uh, that's not the purpose of this process. He said, I know, but I think if you show our salespeople this, I think it's what we want in our, in our organization. So he said, we have a sales program that's working very well. It's greatly increased first-time sales. We call our program Sweat Questions. They're questions designed to make people feel guilty if they don't buy the insurance. It's working very well, except we're losing our best salespeople. <laughs> and we can't get a salesperson in the door for second-time sales. It's very good at first-time sales, you see. So the first thing I made clear to the salespeople is that this process, nonviolent communication, is not designed to get results. What is it designed for? To create a quality of connection with other people in which everybody's needs get met. And they get met through natural giving, not through any guilt questions or shame questions or fear. See? So, in other words, I don't approach this employee with the objective of getting him to work on time or to produce more. I approach this employee with the objective of creating a quality of connection with him that 
will end with both of our needs getting met. This is a radical paradigm shift. Now, the irony of it is, sales went up 50% in each district where... But that wasn't the objective. That's not how I measured the success, nor the company, incidentally. What they were most happy with, they didn't lose their best salespeople. See. But I wasn't trying to get them to sell more life insurance. I said, this process cannot sell a product that doesn't serve life. Because if it doesn't serve the other person's needs, you don't want them to buy it. Your objective needs to be to get everybody's needs met. Okay, so with that theory in mind, let's put that into practice. Uh, so you, let's begin with empathy. And through empathy, show that you see that his not coming to work and his producing near zero is uh, the most wonderful thing in the world he could be doing. So I'm myself. <laughs> <laughs> You're yourself. You're yourself with giraffe ears, yes. And so you want to empathize with what's keeping this person from coming on time. See, not, for, not for the purposes of getting in there on time, but for connecting, so that you can form a connection so that everybody's needs can get met. I just better want to understand what the need is for you to uh, arrive 20 minutes late for work every day. Okay, that's pretty close, but you began with a request. Never make a request, especially when you're in a position of authority, without nakedly revealing what's in your heart at this moment first. Never ask a question or make a request when you're in a position of authority without revealing your heart first. So how are you feeling right now, and what are your needs behind that question? I'm a little frustrated. Um, because my need for the group to work together on an agreed-upon time um, and I'm wanting to know what your need is for showing up 20 minutes late for work. Yeah, you know, uh, there's really uh I could give you an excuse. I could tell you, uh, you know, that there's other things. But, but the fact is, you know, I just, I just have a bad habit. I'm just terrible about time. And uh, I've always been this way. And uh, I know I shouldn't. And, uh, uh, and I tell myself I should be on time. And I do everything I can to get there. And the next thing I know, I'm late. And it happens all the time. And so it sounds to me like your need uh, is uh, you're afraid to be uh, have to be somewhere at a at a particular time. It's you know yeah it's kind of free because I know that uh, I should be there on time and I and I do and I I'll set the clock early I'll, uh, I'll re remind myself and uh, I know I should be on time but and 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 you know I don't know what happens you know but it just I guess I just have a bad habit I just bad about time. So it sounds like you really want to be. They're on time. Yes, I see that, you know, we want to have a team that's ready for work. Uh, I can see that uh, it aggravates everybody when, you know, there's telephone calls waiting for me that I didn't get to, that I told people I'd be there. Uh, I see, and I tell myself this the whole morning. I'll be sure you're on, you know, you have to get there on time today. So it feels like you're frustrated because you're not being able to arrive on time. Exactly. And this is a long-standing thing. I mean, this goes back to the time. I, in school, I had the same problem. I mean, you know, my father, uh, mother, it's not their fault because they were people very prompt, you know, always prompt. And uh, they told me that if I'm to be, you know, a success in life, I have to be prompt. And I agree with them. I can see that, you know, you don't get respect if you're not prompt. I know I should be on time. So you're frustrated yeah. by the fact that you're not able to be yes. there on time? Yes, very frustrating. It's aggravating to me. It's a terrible habit not to be on time. It, it violates other people. It's not respectful to others. It's, it's a terrible habit. So you're frustrated at the fact that not only do you feel you're not on time for yourself, but also for other people? Exactly, yes. 
Yes. So obviously this must be a pretty strong need that this person is meeting. If it's not meeting other needs of theirs, the need that it's meeting must be very strong. See, because people never do anything that isn't in the service of a need. So obviously, even though this person has the same needs that you do for productivity, respect for other people's time, there's an even stronger need that's keeping this person from doing it. So that's empathy for that need is what you need to have, the, the need that is keeping this person from being on time. This person would be on time if it, they weren't meeting another need not to be on time. I love that. The need of respect, even for ourselves, is what I'm hearing also on the time element. It, uh, I'm just kind of curious, is that what you got out of that? Yes. Or, okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marshall. <laughs> and, and I know that uh, one of the things I want to stay with is the tip number three. Would you mind sharing? that with us. Yes, and um, this is to speak positive. And uh, usually um, the idea and the book is about thinking positive. But the way we get our thinking out with words is very, very important. And I found this very um, important in business also. Uh, when I started to do project management. Um, I used to do people and project management. Uh, managing people when you pay their salaries and you ask your team to do a certain job, they are obliged to do it. If they don't, they say, okay, I, I can get fired. But in project management and especially dealing with international teams, they don't report to you. You may choose them uh, to do certain jobs on the project, uh, but you're not paying their salaries. And you would be competing against other projects and other people coming with requests to these teams. So at first, uh, when I moved to the U.S. and I was managing, uh, for example, a project for Japan Airlines to upgrade their whole reservation network and whole uh, offices in North and South America and Asia, Japan and other places in Asia, um, I uh, started to get confrontation with some of these teams when they don't deliver on time or on budget. And I would send emails, okay, this is not acceptable, we're supposed to deliver this by this date, whatever. And uh, I wouldn't get enough corporation from, corporation from them. So at certain stage, I started to send positive emails, like I took the words I used to use, for example, this is not acceptable, uh, this is, you, you know, beyond, you, you know, our target date, how could you do it, okay, you need to act fast, and change this, this is not, change it to, could you please help us speed up the delivery of these routers or equipment so we can have the network in place and the offices up and running and this way management and customers, your customers, will be happy. And in brackets or not sad means you will get the bonus. <laughs> Oh, that's so perfect. the nut or whatever <laughs> negative, I started to change it to positive words and it worked. I tried it over and over and over and I still use it even in personal emails or texts or anything in life and business. Well, thank you for sharing that because that's what Marshall's work's about. No shame, blame, no good, bad. Just get rid of all the judgments and get right focused on the need and move forward with the doable request, which, of course, you just pointed out a perfect example. So tell us, are there 
a couple of funny incidences that you've encountered during your travel? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Um, one about communication <laughs> and languages that I uh, remember would be in Tunisia. Uh, I uh, went twice to Tunisia, beautiful country, Mediterranean to in North Africa, and uh, over there <laughs> I was surprised to find that some of the Arabic uh, words they use in Tunisia, uh, by the way Tunisia used to be a French colony, so their language is mixed uh, with African uh, words and French and Arabic altogether, but some of the words they use um, are like curse <laughs> words, like big curse words in Lebanese <laughs> or in, in the main Arabic language. Uh, I was at the airport and they were calling somebody by their last name and it was like a big, big word, curse word. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> And thank oh. God my uh, sister-in-law used to work there, so she was there, and I asked her, and she briefly, she gave me the list of the words <laughs> that I should not use, <laughs> uh, which also, like, we use uh, some words for food, and they are cur curse words in Tunisia. I, I was very, very surprised, but this happens. <laughs> Another language, right? <laughs> yes, so ask, ask questions. <laughs> Ask questions Perfect. when you go to a foreign place. Oh my gosh, that's good information once again. Ask <laughs> Vanessa. So overall, with the two minutes now already that we have <laughs> left to air, uh, what would you like the audience, what would you like them to leave with? Um, compassion is healing. I believe this strongly for both parties, the one who is communicating and the one who is hearing, who's communicating too. And um, if we can communicate with compassion, we are kind of lifting ourselves, all of us, to a better place yes. in life and yes. in business. So the f three tools I mentioned, first, show respect, very important. And second, don't assume, just ask questions. And the third one is speak positive, always positive. That I believe will lead us to a happier place. And I've experienced it in my life, I applied it in business and it also uh, was very successful, led me to uh, bigger successes in my projects or business overall. Absolutely. Well, like a giving of what you would care to receive and in the process, it's a win-win for all people, right? Yes. So our collective consciousness is what we want to work on. Exactly. What a gift. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gigi, for God. having me. <laughs> I know there's more to share. Darn it, our time's up. <laughs> well, okay, we're going to have to sign a contract to get you back. Okay, <laughs> but I know where to find you, right here in our studio. <laughs> she knows a lot of what's going on here, the inside scoop. We'll talk about that another time, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, well, hey, if anybody would like to email Heba at hebahan. Uh, let's see. Oh, do I have this right? Hebahan.com. Hebahan Perfect, thank you. And you can go to your Facebook.com, the Heba Hamden. And also, it says something at Wisdom for City. Of our city. Of and our city. Yeah, and that's a this small is show I'm starting. Oh, yes. I love it. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Oh, gosh, thank you for loving our city for seven generations my family has. I'm just so proud of that. <laughs> Um, okay, well, for our viewers, we're now in our 14th year here, and wow. I just really enjoy and appreciate your sharing of all the wonderful guests that come in and share 
their knowledge to contribute for more world peace and people peace as well, getting along. Hey, how easy can it be if we really focus on it? So if you want to contact me, you can always call me at 805-698-8233. I'll get to all of this. And also, you can go to Gigi and more TV at gmail.com. Our show website is CompassionateConnection.tv. Uh, next week, we will have back with a Susan Allen life coach here in Santa Barbara. Well, actually, she's life coaching wherever, so we'll talk about that another time. But right now, I'd like to say a special thank you to Dr. Robert Mathis right here, holistic healing doctor in the heart of Santa Barbara, Dr. Joe Michelori, uh, brainstem balancing, a spectacular thing he has going on for healing our body, and also right here at the studio, remarkable Mark Nelson. He has been a key player with our team throughout the years, and boy, does he have compassion. Also, of course, in our control room, Fred, De Fred Winter, we couldn't do the show without Fred. Love you, thank you, and for our viewers, I wish all of you continuous, compassionate moments of connecting. When bro